However, let's uh, stand together as we look into God's Word together. And this morning, I'll be reading from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 16 through 25. I invite you to uh, follow along in your pew Bible or personal Bible. Uh, and I'd uh, like to say, 1 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 16 through 25. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. It is not, is not wheat harvest now? I will call upon the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called upon the Lord, and that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain, so all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. The people also all said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God, for your servants, so we will not die, for we have added to all of our sins the evil of asking for a king. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away from useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, be it far from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully, and in your heart consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, I pray now that as we come to this time of our time together, as we look into your word, I just ask that you would... Uh, open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to what you have for us. Father, I pray that uh, the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you and an encouragement to us as we go from this place. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Andrew, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on this, so it's number one, I think, if you can turn me down just a little bit. Thank you. I'd like you to imagine for a minute that uh, you go to the doctor, and the doctor gives you a diagnosis, which is very, very scary. He says, I've got some bad news for you, and I've got some good news for you. The good news is you have a fatal disease. I mean, no, not the good news. I, I said that wrong. Let me try again. The bad news is you have a fatal disease. The good news is that as long as you take a pill every day, that disease will be held in check. But you must take the pill every day. What would you do? Would you take the pill? I'm thinking the answer, I'm guessing the answer for most of us is, well, of course. It would be silly not to take that pill. Well, what I want you to think about this morning is um, the, the fact that prayer is kind of like that. We're, we have a fatal disease. We're all going to die, but prayer is the thing that can keep us going. And most of you know, and I've mentioned this before every year about this time, that I do not do New Year's resolutions. I just don't believe in them. For one thing, I've never been able to keep them. The only New Year's resolution I have been able to keep is the fact that I don't keep make any New Year's resolutions. I do, however, believe in goal setting, and I do believe in self-reflection, and I do believe that there come times in our lives where we need to look at exactly where we're at with our relationship with God, with our relationship with our families, with our relationship with each other. And I think the beginning of the year is a great time for that, to be able to look at exactly where we're at. And one of the things that I have uh, really tried to make an effort to do each year is to really evaluate my spiritual walk and my walk with God. And the one thing that uh, always seems to come to my mind, just so you know I'm not perfect, and most of you already know that, is the importance of prayer in my life. And I will confess to you, as I have before, that I'm still working on that process. Because prayer is, is vital to our very living. In fact, a uh, Christian author by the name of J. Oswald Sanders says this. He says, prayer does not uh, set us up for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. The most important thing that we can do in our spiritual lives is prayer. And yet we don't do it. It's, it's one of the things that, that, that drives us. It's the one connection that we have with the very heart of God. 
And yet, how many of you have prayed today? That's Sunday. Maybe you did. How about this last week? The average Christian, according to the latest poll, spends approximately 10 10 minutes a day in prayer. And yet it's the most important part of our lives. If I were to ask you, is prayer important? Each one of you would probably say yes. But we don't pray, just like with these people. Do you pray? Oh, when I'm in trouble, I do. <laughs> do you pray? No. Tell me why. I don't know. I don't really know why, to tell you the truth. <laughs> no, usually, actually, actually, I do, but uh, not very regular. Do you pray? Every now and then. Sometimes I do, yes. Every day, several times a day. Five times a day. Many times during a day. Once a week, maybe. Every day, all day. Do you pray? Uh, sometimes, yeah. How often is sometimes? Like, uh, once a month. I try to get it in, morning and night, so. Have you prayed this morning? Um, not this morning, because I was running late. Do you pray? No, I don't. No, I don't. No. Uh, I do not. Tell me why not. Because I don't believe in God. I don't think there is just one religion. And I think that, although maybe I should pray to at least some form of God, but I haven't found it yet. Tell me why not. Um, I'm not really sure what I believe in. Actually, I take that back. I do pray in the sense of just sort of a quiet, reflective time that's more of an introspective analysis. But there's not a supreme being that I would say that I pray to. Tell me what you prayed about. I prayed about um, just the basic prayer, you know, forgiving me of my sins and things of that nature. Just uh, for people I know who've died and just things like that and that everything goes well in the future. Pray for for myself, for my family, yeah, for my people, for everything, yeah. Usually I pray when one of my family members is sick or if I need a new job. <laughs> for forgiveness for the things that I've done wrong. Everything, every, anything you could possibly imagine, I pray about. Do you feel that prayer makes a difference? I think it really does. Whether or not you can, you know, see it happening around you, but it just, I think it's something that makes you feel better. Do you think it makes a difference? If not on anything else, it uh, at least gives me mental peace. And that's what I pray for, actually, most of the time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I can't say how practically, but I know it does the way I feel about things. I think it helps me to keep my focus. It helps me to refocus at times. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in uh, worldly things. And it helps you take a few minutes sometimes, whether you're going to work, or coming home from work, or at the end of the night, to uh, refocus and keep your priorities in line. It's a way of, like, focusing, you know? you know, kind of a stress reliever in a way, too. I believe it does, if not psychologically, at least spiritually. I think it affects both of those qualities. It just makes you feel better, and you, um, it, hel- it helps you feel better about the people you're praying for, and just makes you think, I guess. Did you notice in that video the one common theme about prayer throughout what everybody said? It was all about them. It was all about their lives, about their feelings, about their friends, about their family, about their needs, about the the mistakes that they'd made. It was all about them. And I think that's one of the problems that each of us have with prayer is we think about it as being something about us. And it's not about us. It's about God. But it's so hard to get sucked into that because we can't see him. And so for some people, prayer is just a, a, a weak crutch, a weak psychological cut, crutch that some people do because it makes them feel better. Uh, other people uh, don't think that God really answers prayer. Um, they think that uh, he's going to do whatever he wants, and so there's really no need to do it. There's some people that, um, like the one, what one author said this last week, he said, some people think that answered prayer is just a coincidence, but it's amazing to me that the more often that I pray for a particular thing, the more often those coincidences tend to happen. So what is prayer like? Why don't we do it? You know, I think there's three levels in, in Tim Keller in a book called, a Christian author in a book that he wrote called Prayer, 
uh, describes three different levels of prayer in each of our lives. The first one he describes as being casual prayer. And casual prayer is just those things that we tend to uh, say over and over and over again. Jesus talks about that when he says, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. And we think of that and we read it and we think, well, that uh, that doesn't pertain to me, except if I can pick us on, on us a little bit, every single week we say the Lord's Prayer. How often do we really think about what the Lord's Prayer is really about? I'm 64 years old. I can still sit down, and if you want me to, I could recite when my dad would pray at the table for the meal. I can remember it almost word for word. And yet in the family that I grew up in, um, you know, some of you say the table prayer around the table for meal. In my family, I was taught that that wasn't even really a real prayer, which I don't agree with anymore. But anyway, that that wasn't real prayer because real prayer isn't just following and saying and reciting specific words over and over and over again. It wasn't until I grew up and later realized that my dad was repeating the same words over and over again. It just wasn't his for our version of the table prayer. And there's that, that casual prayer is just things that we say we don't even think about it. And again, um, you know, to spill my own soul in a sense, I catch myself doing it. There's times when I've been driving down the road, I shouldn't even admit this to you, I've been driving down the road and I'll be praying and all of a sudden I'll hear myself saying, thank you for this food. There's no food around for miles. What am I saying? Thank you. I just I get distracted and my mind goes away. And that's kind of what casual prayers is, just those things that we kind of do and we don't even think about it or we repeat it over and over again until there's no more meaning to it. But that's kind of the basic prayer. That's, that's what we start out with. That's one of the reasons I think we do the whole table prayer thing, if I can pick on that, is it gives our kids an idea of what prayer is like. But then there's a the next step to it. And the next step is called committed prayers uh, that um, uh, Keller refers to, committed prayer. And this is the, the kind of praying that we do. It's kind of the next notch up, if I can say that. Uh, for example, I have um, a list, a prayer list. And every day I pray for certain things. You know, on Sunday or every day I pray for my family and I pray for, for you know, my church and I pray for, uh, you know, g uh, those general things every day. But then each day of the week I will pray for a specific thing. It might be for, uh, you know, I kind of go around with you guys and I kind of think of each of your names and I, I pray for you. Or I'll pray for the missionaries or I pray for specific things each day so that I can kind of keep a, a mindset. Now, before I guilt you all too much, I'm not too good at that. Some days, some of you don't get prayed for, but I try. But that's that committed thing where we want to make it a little bit more important. And, and we, we um, like I say, we set up prayer lists and we really concentrate on what that is. John writes about that. He says, and we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests known, we know that he will give us what we ask for. Now, there's a problem with that kind of that verse. And that is there's a lot of people that read that verse and they think, well, Prayer doesn't work, and God must not be real because he's never given me what I ask for. Okay, hold that thought in your mind if you've ever thought of that because we're going to answer that a little bit later. But the, um, the other part of the, what this verse is talking about is the importance of, of praying for each other and really being committed to it, making it an important part of our lives, and a lot of people don't do that. The third, ver the third level of prayer, this is sort of the uh, ultimate prayer, if I can say that, of what uh, Keller talks about, is he calls it combat prayer. You think of what combat is like. In combat, it's a constant battle. You're, you're, you're going up against the enemy. And combat prayer gets us to realize that whatever struggle you're going through right now, and Paul says this in the book of Ephesians, whatever struggle you're going with through right now is a result of Satan attacking you. Because believe me, Satan does not want us to trust God when life gets tough. Satan does not want us to trust God when people fail us. Satan wants us to focus on what we see and what we can touch and what we can hear and feel and not on reality of the spiritual life. In fact, uh, Paul says, he says, every battle we fight is a spiritual battle. And so combat prayer means that I'm going to go to battle for you. 
And you can't just decide when you're going to go to battle. You go to battle when the enemy attacks. Jesus says in Luke chapter uh, 18, verse 1, uh, he, uh, the, Luke writes, he says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show them that they should always pray and never give up. But how many times do we do that? How many times do we pray? You know, uh, we may pray for a specific thing we hear about and we pray about it once and then we just kind of let it go. So when we talk about prayer, what I want to ask, is, what, what I want us to look at, what I want to ask us in a sense, is how do we get beyond that level of casual prayer to being committed and to being at combat in our prayer lives? And I think one of the things we need to do when we look at that is to look at what keeps us from growing in our prayer life. And the first thing that is, is uh, a prideful heart. You know, a prideful heart means this. Basically, it's, there's some things we pray about because they're out of our control. But there's some things we don't need to pray about because, well, we got this. We don't really need God to be involved because we've got this under our control, so we don't need it. And really what that is is pride. It's saying, God, I don't need you. Isaiah says in chapter 59, 2, it says, It's your sins that have cut you off from God because your sins he has turned away and will not listen anymore. There are some of us that believe in the non-scriptural adage, God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible, by the way. There's others that think, well, I'm going to pray to God, but I'm going to pray to the God that I created in my own box. And that's not what prayer is about. Prayer isn't about, about what I can get from it, like, kind of like what the video said. The good news to that, though, comes in John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, when Jesus says, or John writes, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a lot of people, you know, I'm on Facebook a lot, <clears throat> more than I should be some days. And there's a lot of times when people will put out there, they'll put a prayer request, you know, and people put their praying and everything like that. And occasionally I just happen to notice that there's people that say that they're praying, uh, or let me back up, that there's people that will say, I'm going to send positive thoughts your way. Ooh, good. You know, there's nothing more than I want to going into life, knowing that you are giving me positive thoughts. Really? What does positive thoughts mean? How do I know your thoughts are positive in the way I want them to be? Positive thoughts don't do it. It's about prayer. But that's that, that's that pride thing of not really relying on God. So the first thing we need to do is we need to look at our own lives and decide that the Bible is clear in a couple of uh, other verses that I haven't shared that if we're not close to God, God does not hear our prayers. The first prayer that he wants to hear from us is to confess our sins to him and to draw close to him. The second part of uh, that is uh, a divided heart. Uh, divided heart basically says this, Dear God, I want to win the lottery. Just one example. And I hear all the people say amen, right? What's the crux of that? You know, even if you would say like I tend to do of, you know, Lord, if I win the lottery, I'll put an addition on the church for the church, and I'll do this, and I'll do this, and I'll do this. You know, and I haven't won the lottery yet, so apparently I'm going with the wrong motives, right? See, we, we want things for our own benefit. When, when Jesus, or when uh, God, uh, the psalmist, writes about prayer, he talks about drawing close to the heart of God. And a divided heart is a heart that struggles, and I do it, and, and you do it, a heart that struggles with what I want and what God wants, and realizing that sometimes those two things clash, don't they? Because sometimes, maybe even uh, maybe you've even done this on occasion, uh, when you're praying for something deep down inside, you know that maybe God doesn't want this, but you do. That's what a divided heart means. And how do we get past that? James chapter 4, verse 3, and we just talked about this a few weeks ago. It says, even when you ask, you don't get because your motives are wrong and you only want what will give you pleasure. When we approach God as though he's a spiritual vending machine, 
you know, if I do three Bible studies and two prayers this week, I'll get what I want. When we approach God as though he's a spiritual Santa Claus saying, if I'm really good and I don't, you know, beat my children and I don't do all these other things, maybe I'll be on Santa's or God's good list. When we approach God as though he's our spiritual life jacket, you know, I'm going to just put you over here, God put you on the shelf, and as soon as the water starts to come up and I need to be saved, I'll just grab you and put you around my neck, and I'll be good. As long as we approach him prayer that way, prayer doesn't become effective. It stays in that casual state. James says you don't get because you don't ask with the right motives. And there's a third one, and this kind of goes along. It's actually kind of part of the divided heart, and that's a deceitful heart. And that's basically, you remember the song... Um, I did it my way. Remember that old song for those of us who are old like me? That's not a spiritual song for a reason because we've never been told to do things our way. And a deceitful heart gets us to think that we can do things our way and that God will still uh, approve of it. I told you guys the story about it a couple weeks ago about the car that I bought that I couldn't afford, that I shouldn't have bought, that I didn't have peace about buying ever and after I drove it off the lot and drove to a park and I stopped and turned the car off and prayed and dedicated it to the Lord, and a year later he repossessed it from me because I never should have had it in the first place, and just praying over that car didn't make it any more affordable than it was before. Asking God's blessing on what you've already done when you know it wasn't his will doesn't make it okay. And that's what the deceitful heart talks about. John 9.31 says, We know God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who will worship him and do his will. And then in Proverbs it says, Proverbs 28.9, God detests the prayers of a person who ignores the law. So the reality is one of the things that we need to do is our prayer, to get our prayer life in sync with God is first of all to get in sync with God. And a lot of times we live our lives how we want to without really looking at that. So here's our thought for today. Prayer is obedience out of love, not obligation. You know what the difference is between obedience out of love and obedience out of obligation? Of course you do. Obedience out of obligation is why you drive between 55 and 60 miles an hour on the, on the highway. It's out of obligation because you don't want to get a speeding ticket. Obedience out of love means that I know at my house there's certain food I will not go out and buy for my lovely bride because she doesn't like it. And so even though I may like it, I don't buy it because she doesn't like it. That's obedience out of love. Simple illustration. When it comes to prayer, it's the same thing. We obey God in the whole thing of prayer because of our love for him. And, and Samuel says in uh, the passage that we read today, Samuel twelve twenty three, he says, um, As for me, be it far from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. Let me give you a little story about what this passage is about. The Israelites had been, as you remember, rescued from Egypt. They were in the promised land, and God had established Samuel as their priest, and he was sort of their, both their religious as well as their political leader. And the Israelites started looking around, and Samuel was getting old, and his kids were not very stellar. In fact, they were living completely against God. And all of the other nations around the Israelites had a king. And so the Israelites, being the mature, God-believing, God-fearing people that they were, said, we want a king like everybody else. Everybody else has a king. Why can't we have a king? And Samuel said, well, God doesn't want you to have a king because a king will take you away from worshiping him. And they kept begging him and begging him, and finally God came to Samuel, and he says, you know what? Give him a king. Give him a king. So this is why Samuel came to him and says, because of your attitude, God has given you a king, but you need to remember. And that's why he did the, the, uh, the miracle that was talked about earlier where he had rain and thunder come at a time that it shouldn't come. It was obviously from God, and it was a showing by Samuel the fact that God can do what God uh, says he'll do. And so Samuel says, and this is rather interesting, he says, be it far from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. In other words, if we don't pray, it's a sin. 
It's not a sin of commission, but a sin of omission. It's a sin in the sense that we go against what God wants because he wants to talk to us. He wants to listen to us. And the Israelites go on to say, or the Israelites respond by, uh, let me back up. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, if you will not listen to God's word, neither will God listen to your word when you come to him in prayer. Isn't that a startling statement? If you will not listen to God's word, if you're not in this, if you're not fellowshipping within the church, if you're not digging deep into what God wants from you, he doesn't listen to your prayers. He can't hear you. Because what he wants is the prayer of a heart that is in tune with him. And so when Samuel said this to the Israelites, uh, they responded by saying, be sure, but be sure, Samuel says, be sure to fear the Lord. Uh, if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. What Samuel is saying is this. He's saying, I promise you, as your spiritual leader, that I will pray for you. I will pray for you out of an obligation of love because that is what God commands each of us to do, is to pray for each other. But remember this. If you insist upon going your way and cons insist on going against what, I, what God tells us, then basically says God will uh, turn you, basically says, will turn you over to your own consequences is what he's saying in that verse. So, what can we do to develop a prayerful spirit? Because that's what it's really about. And like I say, I, I'm struggling with this too. But one of the things we need to realize is the only power this church will have, the only power you will have is develop a, a strong, effective, combat style prayer life. How can we do that? The first thing is this, scheduled prayer. You schedule everything else in your life. If you look at our January calendar, it's a real, the stuff that we've got to try and schedule in. Schedule prayer. Make sure that it's a part of your life. And it doesn't have to be uh, an hour. It doesn't have to be four hours like Martin Luther did. But spend some time with God each day. Important. Second thing is push. Pray until something happens. Now, when I say that, I, don't, I did not say pray until God gives you what you want. Maybe as you're talking with him and growing closer to him, you'll start to realize, oh, you know, maybe that's not such a good idea anyway. I guess I'll go with your idea, God, because his ideas are always best. Pray. Continue to push that. That's why Jesus said in, in Luke, you know, uh, continue to pray and don't give up. The third thing is to pray impulsively. Impulsive spending is dangerous. Any amens to that? But impulsive praying is powerful. When we get a prayer request, in fact, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be inviting you if you want to be a part of our prayer chain. And one of the things that we're going to be saying with that is the importance of when we send out a prayer request to you, to stop and pray for it. And maybe when I say stop, I don't even mean you know, physically stop. But in, if you get the request while you're driving down the road, take a couple minutes to pray about that while you're driving, or if it's at home or whatever, but pray impulsively. If God, and I say this quite often, I'll tell you that we're called to be intercessors, not interrogators. If God lays somebody on your heart within this fellowship or a friend or a neighbor that you know is going through a struggle, take some time right then and there to offer up a prayer. There are so many stories out there of people in the mission field, that people that are in the armed forces, where they will be going through a tremendous trial and struggle, and all of a sudden, something will happen to help them out and then they'll find out months later somebody was praying for them. Pray impulsively. The third thing is, use a, if, if, it's, if prayer is sort of a new thing for you, is to, I've got the Lord's Prayer up there, it doesn't need to be that, but find a pattern that you can follow to pray. I like the Lord's Prayer because if you look at it, for one thing we all know it, or we should, uh, so it's somewhat familiar to us. If you look at it, it starts out by talking about just spending time worshiping God, thinking about who he is. Our Father in heaven. What does that mean? It talks about our own spiritual needs. Lead us not into temptation. Protect me from those things that I know will lead me into sin. It talks about our physical needs. Give us our day. Give us today our daily bread. It talks about our relationships. Forgive my trespassers or forgive those who trespass against me. 
He talks about all those things. Spend some time using that as a pattern, perhaps. Charles Stanley says this. To be sure to fear, be sh but be sure to fear the, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, lost my notes. To have God speak to the heart is a majestic experience, an experience that people may miss if they monopolize the conversation and never pause to hear God's response. Have you ever gone somewhere on a road trip with somebody? And it's kind of an uneasy, awkward one because the person you're riding with is like somebody you don't know. Have you ever had that situation? I've had it a couple of times where I'm giving a kid ride home or something like that. And it's like you're driving down the road and you think, well, I should say something, but I don't know what to say. So you think, well, maybe I'll turn the radio on, but you don't want to turn the radio on because that might give them the message that you don't want to talk to them. So you just kind of sit there in awkward silence. Or have you ever gone on a road trip? You know, Trish and I and the girls, back when they were younger and we had time to do so, uh, would go on road trips, and it was great. In fact, we just we went somewhere this last week with all four of us, and it was so nice to be back to that again, just because we were talking, we were laughing, and then there were times of silence because that was okay. And then we'd be talking and making memories of this and that. It was great. Sometimes I think our prayer life is that, like that road trip with somebody we don't know. And we don't know exactly how to converse with God because we don't know him that well. Well, my prayer for us as individuals is we have that relationship with God where not only do we just spend time talking in our prayer life, but we spend time listening. So let me ask you this question as we close. When you pray... Who does most of the talking? Have you ever thought of that? When you pray, is it just you talking? Can you imagine if in, in your marriages or friendships or work situation or whatever, can you imagine what it was like if you were the only one that was doing the talking and nobody else did or flip it around the other way? of You didn't get a chance to talk because the other person talked constantly. You know those people. But in our prayer life, there needs to be time when we talk with God, but we also spend time letting him talk with us. Turn off the TV. Turn off the radio. You can get rid of the devices and spend some time just with God asking him what he wants to say to you, not just telling him. Because you know what? One of the things that prayer does, prayer doesn't always change our situations. But real prayer oftentimes changes how we react to our situations. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the privilege that we have of prayer. And I confess to you that uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that our prayer lives with you are extremely weak. Uh, we spend more time talking to you than we do uh, listening to you. I pray for us here in this fellowship, and I just ask that over the next couple of weeks as we look at prayer, you would help us to draw closer to you, uh, to see you as our heavenly daddy, uh, to realize and listen to what you have to say for us. Help us to have a, a full understanding of what your love is about as we do so, and I pray these things in your name. Amen. As we get ready to take, uh, as we get ready to partake in the Lord's Supper, Something occurred to me as I was thinking about this. You remember the story of the people on the road to Emmaus? Jesus had been crucified. He'd risen from the dead. The word had started to spread. Two of his disciples are on their way to Emmaus. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears and starts to talk to them. Remember that story? And all of a sudden, they recognized Jesus. Do you remember what part of that story they recognized Jesus at? It was when he prayed. It was when he prayed. And he broke bread, and all of a sudden their eyes were open to who he was. They recognized his prayer. Do you recognize God's voice this morning? As we take time to look at the Lord's Supper this morning, that's sort of my challenge to us, if I can say that, is to be reminded just as Jesus said, because as he, and I'll ask the ushers to come forward as we get ready for the uh, Lord's Supper. Uh, he said, as often as you drink this 
cup as often as you eat this bread, remember all that I've taught you. And that's what it's really about. 